Welcome, everybody. If you're not one of our regulars here at Reformation, welcome to Reformation. But uh, Capitol Hill Corral people, you spent a lot of time in this room. Uh, so glad that everybody could make it this evening. Uh, we've been working pretty hard on this dinner. And we're really excited for the presentations that we're about to hear. Um, so first up, we have a professor at American University and SAIS. Uh, this is Mamuka. He is himself Georgian, but he's going to tell you his biography story because I don't want to mess it up. Um, <laughs> and he's going to mostly be talking about Georgia's civilization, culture, its geopolitical importance, all the stuff that I definitely didn't learn in my high school class. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to learning from him this evening. And then following him, we're going to hear from Parker Jane, who most of us already know, but he is, uh, has been extremely important in, in this chorale's ability to perform the, the Palayashvili litur liturgy that we're going to be singing in Georgia next year. Uh, so we wanted him to speak and tell us all about how we got from a lost copy in a library to a score that we could sing from in Georgia and here in DC. So I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, so everybody, please <clears throat> welcome Mamuka. Thank you. Thank you, Gabi. So uh, I have a pretty difficult task to um, convey um, civilizational uh, evolution of Georgia from about, for about 2 million years in about 20 minutes. Uh, but I'll try my best. Um, as uh, Gabi mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Georgian, originally Georgian, but now I'm a U.S. citizen as well. I came here about 24 years ago as a Georgian diplomat for almost four years. And then I started several other activities here. I started to teach at American University in 2002. I became full-time professor in 2007. Then in 2013, I moved to SAIS, and I was part of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute there. I'm still part of that institution, which now moved to different uh, think tanks, like it happens frequently in Washington. People move around. And um, so I'm continuing teaching on a part-time basis, but I focus more on, on research. And um, um, I'm also involved in everything Georgian. Uh, in, in this town and in the U.S., uh, promoting investments to Georgia and uh, tourism and wine and everything uh, else that is positive uh, for Georgia and coming from Georgia. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, that's an uh, that's important part of uh, my life. So, my, as I said, uh, my task is difficult, but uh, it's also very kind of exciting and, uh, and uh, interesting. So. I think uh, MEP is a very important uh, concept. Um, my basic education is in, in social and economic geography, and, uh, uh, which you call here in this country human geography. Uh, and uh, that's where Georgia is. That's where United States is, for some of you who don't know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, big neighbor in the north, and many big neighbors in the south. So not a best location in terms of um, for survival of very small country historically. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, you name invaders, in big invaders in history, and probably except uh, Japanese, they all been to Georgia <laughs> uh, in different uh, uh, periods of history. So. Uh, I don't know how you see, uh, but I just wanted to show Georgia in, in, in the neighborhood as well, in a context of neighborhood. So you see Georgia here, and there's Turkey here, there's Iran here, uh, of course Russia again, Ukraine is here, this is Crimea, contested territory of Russian, annexed this recently territory. This is Black Sea, uh, and also some of the difficult areas, areas of, of recent uh, history, Syria, Iraq, and so forth. So it's like 250, 300 miles from some conflict areas. Um, you don't feel it when you are in Georgia anymore, but, uh, but that's, that's what it is. So just to realize where this country is today and there, where it was historically. 
Uh, but also, I, I, I should probably mention that Georgia was always in a sort of civilizational uh, crossroads, and that's why I use this word, because it was, in a sense, on a front line of civilizations. For like maybe like 2,000 years ago, uh, Georgia was a, a front line for mostly barbarian invaders from the north and east coming into Roman Empire or Greek uh, civilization. And Georgians were kind of protecting those civilizations by fighting against those uh, invaders. Later, it became uh, one of the first uh, Christian countries uh, as a state with the state religion of Christianity in the fourth century. Uh, and, uh, and also was facing mostly uh, Muslim invaders coming from the east and uh, again protecting Byzantium and, and, uh, and Eastern Roman Empire at that time and so forth and so on. So this is historically it was always something going on in terms of civilizational clashes as it is today but we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later about this. So this is a map of Georgia. I'd like to check how it looks from here because colors are a little distorted. Uh, but anyways so uh, this is Tbilisi capital. That's where you, where you are going to land. There's the airport right here. And, uh, and wine country, by the way, grapes grow almost everywhere in Georgia. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a wine country everywhere you go. But the uh, uh, biggest wine country is Kacheti to the east of, of Tbilisi and uh, Kartli right here, and you end up also in Kutaisi, which is the second largest city in Georgia. And uh, uh, for, um, for your information, also for you to understand the, some of the internal and external problems that Georgia is facing, and uh, you've heard probably recent, uh, 10 years ago, Russia invaded Georgia. There was a conflict around this area, Tsinwali region, what we call, and Russia and the entire world calls it South Ossetia. Uh, and Abkhazia area here. These are separatist areas of Georgia currently under Russian uh, occupation. There are military troops there, Russian military troops there. And uh, so that's a big challenge that country is facing for last, since early, since independence, I would say, since early 90s. Um, so let's move forward. Uh, I think since one of my tasks was to talk about culture and sort of Georgian heritage and where this country emerged from and uh, what is the cultural heritage of, of, of Georgia. So I focused on several archeological uh, uh, sites that have significance not for Georgia only but for the entire world. And uh, uh, some of, I mean, those are uh, <coughs> the Manisi, and I'll show in, on a map later. Uh, this uh, Manisi, where the uh, first uh, uh, human ancestors outside of Africa were found. There are 1.8 million years old uh, human ancestors found in the Manisi. If you are if you are not planning to go to the Manisi, I strongly recommend to go there. So it's a very inter interesting, exciting place to go. Second one is that you all know. Last year, on November 13. American Academy of Science published an article about history of wine, and they, it's, this research actually proved 8,000 years of history of Georgian winemaking. And there are wines that are made in Georgia today exactly the way they were made 8,000 years ago. And there are some of them available in the US, but you'll taste them a lot while you go, you go to, to Georgia, of course. And the third thing is that we, how uh, Western world probably first learned about Georgia was this uh, myth about uh, Argonauts and uh, Golden Fleece. Uh, Jason landed in, uh, in Fazis, which is currently port of Poti, and that's where he learned, I mean, there he was, his objective was to obtain Golden Fleece, and he did. He took with him not only Golden Fleece, but also took uh, Princess Medea with him, and Medea is a, uh, was, uh, uh, she, uh, world medicine actually comes from Medea, and uh, she knew a lot of traditional uh, how to make some of the medications, traditional medications, and she was uh, part of this uh, process of spreading this knowledge of of, uh, of um, tr uh, treatment and healthcare in uh, in in the Western world, meaning Greece at that time. So these are the focus areas. Uh, this is. 
uh, the money see right here. By the way, this is high Caucasus mountains that cross from Black Sea here to Caspian Sea. It, it's much higher in this area, in the central part of Caucasus, mostly Georgian part of Caucasus. Also, part of it goes into Russia in the North Caucasus. Today it's Russia, it used to be traditionally Northern Caucasus, different ethnic groups that, who populate Northern Caucasus. Uh, so, Manisi is south of Tbilisi in this area here, and uh, it's uh, historically was crossroads, a trade crossroads, and, uh, and uh, it's interesting that this 1.8 million years old uh, ancestors of humans, we are found in that particular place, uh, and it's not just one generation, but several generations, generations were, um, of, of human ancestors living in that area. But most interesting thing is that uh, uh, this, this, by the way, these are publications from Science Magazine and all the other about findings of Admanisi. And National Geographic had a big, uh, big publication, separate publication dedicated to, uh, completely on, for, for, on, on this subject. So, uh, oops. <laughs> this is the Manisi as well, by the way. And what is interesting in there, when you go there, you see layers of civilizations. And if you want to really learn about layers of civilization presented in one particular place, this is place to go. You see 1.8 million years old uh, humans, uh, remains of humans, and then you see different civilization layers on top of it, including at some point in medieval times, uh, uh, churches like this, but even before that, like six, 7,000 years old quarries, which are the vessels where wines are made. So interesting, very interesting place to visit. Uh, this map is a sort of uh, tourist map for Ge of Georgia. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there are ski resorts. You know, Gudaur is very high, high mountain ski resort. There are Bakuriani. Of course, that's where the Ar Argonauts came. I didn't focus much about uh, Argonauts. Uh, and we can maybe, if, if we have time later on. Are there beaches on that? Yes, here. <laughs> best, best beaches in, in Georgia are unfortunately not under Georgian control currently. They are in the northern part, uh, in Abkhazia, and mostly Russians enjoy that, uh, not Georgians. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, not many tourists go there because of security and other, other considerations. But this area on the Black Sea, Georgia, is very, very popular. By the way, uh, Georgia is a nation of, uh, you know how many people live in Georgia? Anybody knows? <laughs> <laughs> Good, we can even read. <laughs> so, it's 3.7 million, and last year, Georgia had uh, more than 7 million visitors. And this year expected more than 8 million visitors. Not all of them are so-called tourists, you know, for the definition. Tourist means, tourist means when you stay at least overnight, at least one night in the country, so you are considered to be tourists. But, it's a, a lot of people are coming and living, they're transiting or whatever, but most of these visitors, more than seven million, we are obviously staying there longer than one night. So it's a big part of the Georgian, Georgian revenues, Georgian income, about 17, 18% of Georgian GDP comes from tourism industry. So uh, it's a still not very rich country, of course. Georgia doesn't have oil, doesn't have major mineral resources and so forth, and it went through very turbulent first 25 years of regaining of independence. So economic-wise, it has many challenges and problems, but it's progressing, and if you see trajectory of development of country, it's positive. So you see cultural heritage, 12,000 historical cultural heritage sites. Out of this, by the way, there are three UNESCO heritage sites. We'll, I'll show you photographs of that and tell you a little bit about those. Uh, but also, you know, uh, in terms of uh, natural beauty, it's very interesting and very great diversity, great variety, several uh, climatic zones, and also because of the uh, uh, mountains, you have a desert and a very low lands uh, near Black Sea uh, to all the way very high mountains. The highest mountain in Georgia is probably around 17 close to 17, 18,000 feet. So it's about 5,400 meters. So, 
not as high as Himalayas, but higher than probably, I mean, definitely higher than European uh, Alps. And in addition, by the way, uh, uh, in addition to, uh, I mean, uh, material heritage side, Georgia's polyphonic singing and uh, query winemaking method, uh, method are also considered to be in the list of uh, uh, intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Some of you may know that one of the Georgian songs, Chakrulo, was incorporated into the uh, Voyager, I think first, 1997 flight. Voyager took several uh, items of cultural heritage with it to show our relatives elsewhere in the space <laughs> uh, achievements of culture. And one of them was Chakrulo, this Georgian, um, Georgian song. Yeah. So this is the Manisi again. This is also the Manisi. That's where they found, while they're digging for other things, they found query, which is the, where the wines were made. By the way, they also found some of the remains of people in, buried in queries, in, in clay amphoras. So. You know, this, all these publications uh, about uh, uh, cradle of Georgian made cradle of wine. Uh, so I'll skip some of this. Uh, by the way, last year there was a, mm, a very interesting exhibition. Uh, uh, the Bordeaux opened new museum of wines, Le Cité du Wain, and uh, it opened, first international exhibition, there was Georgian exhibition. And I, I, was, I was honored to be invited for the opening uh, in September of last year, and it was very, very interesting and exciting exhibition. We hope to bring that exhibition to the United States maybe, uh, maybe by 2020. Uh, and I'll mention briefly later some of the activities that would lead to that. <coughs> so this is again uh, how uh, Argonauts traveled to Georgia, the Fazis, this is where Poti is. Uh, again, skip a little bit of that. Uh, by the way, this entire area, about 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, was inhabited by Greek colonies. In addition to local, obviously, communities, they had also a lot of Greek, 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 uh, Greek colonies, and they interacted and trade was going on. And most of the wines at that time, by the way, from Georgia were exported to uh, what is current today is Crimea and other, other Greek settlements on the Black Sea. Also, it was going to the east, southeast as well. So language, I think we should mention that it's very unique language. It's called Kartwellian group of languages. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there are different, um, uh, uh, actually, uh, interpretations of where Georgian alphabet com are com is coming from. Most of the scholars think that it, it was... Uh, uh, created under the influence of Greek alphabet uh, with the Christianity in the fourth century. Uh, but there are some, some uh, uh, historians and scientists who think that maybe even older, maybe be like fourth, third century uh, BC. Uh, at least origins of Georgian alphabet could be going that, that, uh, that far in the past. So, and the uh, name Geor Georgians call themselves Kartvelis, and countries called Sa Kartvelo. By the, by the way, Lithuanian, uh, Lithuanian um, uh, parliament just adopted the new uh, law that now, now, now on will call Georgia, no longer call Georgia, it will call Sakartuel. And uh, so we just kind of first, first step in that direction. It's, it's hard, I know. It's like one day uh, um, Upper Volta was renamed to Burkina Faso. And it's very hard to move to one name to another, but once you get, get accustomed to that, and newer generations probably will, will call Georgia Sakartuelo. But the word uh, Georgia comes from Greek word uh, Georgos, which means farmer, and by extension, obviously, wine grower. Uh, there's another story as well, because I studied Farsi when I grew up, and um, there's a, my Farsi teacher was telling me that, okay, there's this one version of this story, but there's another version of the story. Uh, uh, in, in Farsi, Georg means wolf, and Georgians were good fighters, and they were always fighting the Persians since like 3,000 years. And uh, Persians were calling Georgians Gurji, which means Gorg, which means wolf. And Gurjistan is the name, was the name. And to this day, Turks, uh, Iranians, and others call Georgia Gurjistan. So it could be coming from that as well, but you know, 
Georgians, we like to be Europeans, so. <laughs> so th I mentioned three UNESCO uh, sites. Uh, one is uh, uh, Gelati Monastery. Why this site is very important, in addition to be a very interesting site as architectural sort of uh, uh, example of uh, traditional Georgian Christian architecture uh, built in 12th century. Gelati also was academy. So Gelati and another uh, place in Georgia called Ihalto had academies. Georgia had two academies in the 12th century, 12th, 13th century exactly organized and built like Bologna Academy around the same time. So based on classical uh, Greek Hellenistic sort of educational model at that time. And by the way, uh, best, I mean, most prosperous and most successful times of Georgian history is between 11th and 13th century, what is in Georgian historiography is called the uh, Renaissance of Georgia. And most of the significant, these architectural sites and many other things historically were done about that period of time. So Gelati is very significant. It is located in Kutaisi. So you'll be visiting Gelati. There's another site there as well, Bagrati's, uh, 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 Cathedral Bagrati, which is very also interesting site and uh, hopefully you'll have a chance. Good, good. So um, there is a, another site called uh, 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 next to Tbilisi, which is current capital, is old capital of Georgia, which was capital until 5th century, called Mtscheta. I know it's very easy to pronounce. So. <laughs> Mtscheta. And uh, <clears throat> later, later on, I'll teach you another word. And if you learn that word, you are, you are proficient in Georgian. So. <laughs> and the word is pronounced Brdvna. <laughs> And it means to tear somebody apart. <laughs> you may need it, who knows? <laughs> so Ntsheta is a place where Georgia actually was baptized as a political Georgia was baptized. Saint Nino is a baptizer of Georgia. She came to Georgia in the early fourth century. She, uh, um, uh, she uh, Georgian, again, legend tells that she was related to, uh, to Saint George. From, and she came from Cappadocia. And uh, actually, she, she was 15 years old. She entered Georgia from the south. And uh, she uh, created her uh, cross using wine tree branches, two wine tree branches with her own hair. So created first cross and started to walk around uh, uh, Georgia and baptize people, in a sense, proselytizing, bringing uh, 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 knowledge of, of, of Christianity to Georgians. Uh, in this particular site, which is called now Jwari Monastery, Jwari in Georgian means cross, uh, was a, a pagan at that time, uh, uh, some symbol, and the king, Georgian king, uh, Miriam, his wife, were conducting some kind of uh, traditional uh, service, and uh, Nino was next to them and uh, trying to convince them that it's time to switch to Christianity and so forth. But the story is that at some point, uh, the son, uh, there was probably, uh, anyway, so to make it short, uh, several uh, events occurred that convinced King to move to Christianity. And so uh, this is the, uh, this is Mtscheta, that's where the, uh, actually a new era of Georgian history started with Christianity. And this, uh, this site overlooks uh, the, uh, the old capital. And this is uh, the cathedral of Svetic Hoveli, uh, which is again, this, this entire town has, is filled with lots of uh, small and large monuments and archeological sites and so forth. And uh, <coughs> so that's why, no, no wonder why it's included in the UNESCO heritage. And the next one, the third one, is Swaneti. Of course, uh, uh, this is high in the mountains in the western part of the country. Unfortunately, you are not going to visit on this trip, but maybe next trip. Uh, because, you know, I rarely see people who come to Georgia who do not want to come back. So uh, hopefully you'll come back after your first trip. 
And uh, these are medieval, medieval fortresses, but also houses. People lived there at the same time they were protecting themselves from this. By the way, because of many, many invaders and invasions to Georgia, a lot of uh, 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 treasures of Georgia, historical treasures, icons, you know, golden items and so forth, starting from 14th century when Georgia got weaker and, and uh, it was hard to protect really uh, country, they moved these treasures to these areas. And uh, most of them are actually very well preserved and uh, Mestia now has one of the, I would say, best museums in the world. It's a small museum but very well organized and lots of items uh, reflecting uh, not only Georgian cultural heritage, but a lot of um, uh, other uh, regional, starting from Rome, ending with the uh, Persian culture uh, reflected there. So uh, <clears throat> again, as, as I said earlier, historically serving as a buffer between great powers. So that was a uh, very, very important function of Georgia historically was transit and, and, and it was like on the trade routes. And one of the biggest uh, geopolitical disasters for Georgia was fall of Constantinople to Turks. And that really, uh, and, and it, it happened in 19, uh, 1452. And it uh, really uh, created the environment when, uh, first of all, it, it, it evolved into greater war between Ottoman Empire and and European, other European powers. So trade routes were no longer functioning. And uh, Georgia started to gradually decline because there was not much trade and Turks were also coming to, to, to Georgia as well and invading and there was not much power left uh, and, and many other reasons. By the way, Turks were preceded by also in, in that 15th century invasion was of course, uh, preceded by several other invaders, invaders from Mongols first, and then Tamer, Tamerlan. Tamerlan actually invaded Georgia eight times and burned. And uh, I mean, that was the most disastrous inv invader in, in Georgian history. Anyway, so uh, yeah, let's move forward. Uh, I don't think that you need to. So this is an interesting map because of. Uh, uh, Georgia, once it became independence, uh, independent again, by the way, Georgia had a brief uh, independence period. I assume that you know that Georgia was independent state until 1801. That's when it became part of Russian Empire. Russia annexed Georgia in 1801. Until then, first it was unitary Georgian state, then it was divided in three different kingdoms, Imereti, Kacheti, and Kartli. And, and several other principalities, and then all of them were uh, annexed by Russia in the 19th century. Briefly, 1918-1921, Georgia was independent again. But uh, Bolshevik Russia reconquered Georgia in 1921. After that, Georgia became independent again in 1991. And since that period of time, initial very turbulent period, lots of like civil conflicts and these separatist movements and so forth, Starting from mid-90s, uh, by the way, with the help of the United States uh, and with the uh, benefits of having lots of hydrocarbon resources in Azerbaijan and Caspian Sea, as well as in Kazakhstan. So uh, many companies, Western companies, mostly US companies, came into this area and started developing oil and gas fields there. But uh, it was interesting time because uh, <clears throat> Russia was in a turbulent period as well, and Iran was already kind of getting into, uh, you know, what, what the relationships are between the United States and Iran. So uh, from the beginning of this, this development, companies focused on uh, building um, export routes for those hydrocarbon resources to Western markets because this uh, these resources were mostly developed at that time for European markets. And still, to this day, uh, they serve mostly European markets, although uh, some portion of the production goes to Israel and, and Turkey as well. So uh, first pipeline that was built in, in uh, crossing Georgian territory actually was done in, in 19th century, I mean, uh, early 20th century. But uh, um, a, after the beginning of independence, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey at that time collaborated with the, very closely 
with the help of the United States. So they built this Baku Supsa pipeline first, relatively smaller pipeline, and then so-called, we call it BTC pipeline, or Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline. Jehan is a big port in Turkey, big export outlet, not only for Georgian, I mean, uh, Azerbaijani and Caspian oil, but also for Iraqi oil and some other countries' oils as well. It's a big port here. And uh, so uh, Georgia somehow returned on the global map of trade and transit and uh, global economic map. So, uh, and this was significant and important for, uh, for Georgia to build its statehood, rebuild its statehood, and, and since this period of time, then another pipeline was built, natural gas pipeline. Georgia was very dependent on Russia on energy resources, and Russia used it uh, against Georgia many times. After these developments, by 2006, 7 actually Georgia was no longer dependent on, on, on Russian oil anymore, or Russian gas. I think that was one of the contributors why probably conflict, among other things, emerged between Russia and Georgia. But uh, so this pipeline now is extended and another pipeline is built and will take natural gas from here, molecules actually, from Caspian Sea, natural gas molecules, will travel through uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, then to Bulgaria, uh, Albania, Gr uh, Greece, uh, there will be two, Greece and uh, uh, Bulgaria, and then Albania, and, and will end up in Italy. So, yes, do we have time for questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 just opposite. It's against the Gazprom. From, uh, <laughs> no, it's actually alternative to Russian, because Russia dominates European market for gas. This is alternative to Russian supplies to Europe. So, and... Uh, uh, this entire development happened because of this finding energy security solutions for European, European uh, countries, particularly Eastern European countries. So uh, I'll move forward. Uh, another thing, interesting thing this is happening, you all probably heard about Chinese big projects. They, initially they used to be calling it uh, uh, One Belt, One Road. Now they call it Belt and Road Initiative. And Belt and Road Initiative is actually connecting China to the rest of the world, and, uh, but using all the directions. And the uh, most easy, easy and economic way to connect uh, China to, uh, to Europe is uh, uh, sea lines. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but they're taking like 40 days, 50 days, and, and, and sometimes you need certain things to be delivered on market, and, uh, products with a shorter shelf life in two weeks or 10 days or 20 days or something like that. And that, for that, this so-called, um, what historically used to be called Silk Road, now they call it BRI, uh, China initiated this new project and they are looking at Central Asia and Caucasus as a one of the ways to connect to Europe. Now, countries of the region are definitely very interested in having as much transit as possible through their territory because it's economic impact and also economic uh, revenues. But they're worried about you know, how much political uh, uh, conditionality will come with that. Because when US help was helping Georgia and Azerbaijan and Turkey to develop these pipelines, US did not present any conditionality other than freedom of citizens. Everything is relative, but uh, these, these countries, particularly at that time, the, uh, the level of democracy, Georgia still maintains a very high degree of, of democracy, but uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey probably were doing much better then than they are doing now in terms of their, their, their freedoms. But fact is that there was no conditionality for U.S. to, I, I'll do, I'll support this if, in case you do some things for me. There was no such a conditionality at that time. It was only reason why U.S. supported these countries were to really avoid major uh, cataclysms in the region, avoid refugees to uh, kind of leaving uh, US and I mean uh, the Caucasus and going to somewhere else. And, and mostly uh, really focusing on, um, on stability and interest of stability in the world, including in, the, in, the, in, in Europe, uh, allied, allied countries. Uh, China is different. They come and they ask, and by the way, US doesn't have any, uh, any uh, state-owned companies that have ownership in any of the assets there. While China is coming with the state-owned companies and obtains the uh, ownership on the companies and so forth. It creates certain tensions in some countries, 
And you see resistance to this in Central Asian countries like Kyrgyzstan and uh, Kazakhstan and others. But there is also resistance now emerging in Caucasus countries as well. But this is the reality of, of, um, of but this is important for us to understand. Georgia is, an, on, when I say it's Georgia's country on the crossroads, it's crossroads in a symbolic and kind of maybe spiritual sense, but it's also crossroads on the, literally in terms of transits, north, south, east, west, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is uh, both, you know, blessing and the curse uh, because uh, more mm, interest you have, it's good for some reasons, but if, if there are interests that dominate other interests uh, and can overwhelm you or overwhelm other interests, then you fall in somebody's hands and that's not good. By the way, uh, my colleagues and I, we are working on this concept, what we call uh, land Suez. So to create Caucasus as an artery, it's corridor for transit uh, of goods that will serve not just one or two or three or five countries, but everybody, India, China, you know, uh, Central Asian countries, European countries, Turkey, Mediterranean countries, and even Russia and others. Uh, who could just maybe set, be satisfied with the fact that they share something with others and they are not the sole owners. Dif difference between Western approach and Chinese or Russian approach is that they want to own, control rather, not own, control, and not to share with others. So enough about geopolitics. Uh, I'm trying to just give you this perspective, uh, but there is a one, one a little phrase I would like to end my uh, presentation. If, if we have time, maybe I can answer a couple questions, but if not, then we'll move forward with a uh, much more interesting presentation. <laughs> uh, but I would like to, to read, no, before we go there, yeah. One thing that uh, 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 I, I think I've mentioned this already, we don't need to talk about this, and we'll skip this. And there are beautiful sites, of course, uh, Tbilisi capital. So this is what I wanted to, uh, maybe I'll read for, read for you. So it's a, from John Steinbeck. And uh, he was in Georgia with the photographer Kappa and they documented their trip to Georgia. And, uh, his, 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 and he wrote uh, so-called Russian, he visited obviously the Soviet Union at that time. And he documented uh, his, uh, um, I think he's called Russian, story or something like that, that, that in, in, uh, I don't recall now the name of the, of the because I read it first time actually in Russian. So. Uh, but uh, he ends his, his, uh, his memoirs or, or recollection of, of Georgia with these words. It's a magical place, Georgia, and it becomes dreamlike the moment you left it. And people are magic people. It is true that they have one of the richest and most beautiful countries in the world and they live up to it. So. I hope when you go to Georgia and when you leave to Georgia, you will have the same feelings as uh, um, this wonderful man had. So I'll end on this, and uh, I don't know, where is our boss here? Gabby? <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, before she comes, we can use Couple questions, yeah. Yes, please. You know, Georgian church plays a very, very important role in Georgian life. It used to play always very important uh, role. Today, probably, is more powerful than maybe e even ever. Because what happened is that because Soviets were oppressing religion, uh, when, uh, when Georgia became independent again and uh, with the national independence also came this religious independence. And, uh, but because of Georgians are very traditionalists uh, and uh, uh, in a sense conservative, uh, so uh, they, I mean, um, I'm trying to find the right sort of uh, balance between what I'm going to say. Uh, on one hand, they are very traditionalist and very religious. At least they claim that they are very religious. Yeah. 
But at the same time, they are very free people and they like to live life and enjoy life and drink wine and, uh, you know, uh, do other things that I won't say now. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, while traditionally Georgians were deeply Christian and always fought for Christianity, they were not just passive Christians that were just, you know, observing certain kind of traditions, but they were fighting for Christianity. It was most important element of uh, and supportive sort of core element of uh, helping Georgia to maintain its national in identity as well, because Christianity was a like integral, it still is integral part, is considered to be integral part of Georgian identity. So I, I, I'd say, I would say that Georgian church is playing a very important role, but like you know, there is a Georgian saying, it sounds in Georgian, Rats eri is beri. So every problem that Georgian uh, secular m m people have, same is in, in obviously church. So there are no, uh, it, it's, it's not, its transition is not easy from being in, in uh, from coming from secular state that was oppressing religion for many years, uh, going into uh, like uh, like free um, society where things are slightly different and and um, so if you when you are in Georgia you will see there are not only all the churches in Georgia but many new churches built it's considered to be like now duty for many Georgians who have some income to somehow contribute to this religious revival but at the same time Obviously, you know, uh, it's, it's, there are responsibilities that is coming with the religion as well, and not, I mean, there are, there are issues with that. And uh, so it's like any other society, Georgia has, is facing its, its own, own issues. But I would say that it's, a, it's an integral part of uh, traditional Georgian identity to continue to uh, play a very important role going forward. When the entire world is now uh, facing this emergence of uh, nationalism, uh, and uh, populi populistic nationalism, I would say. I don't know if you heard what is happening in Romania, in other countries, in Hungary, in Poland, and other places, but in Western Europe as well. Even Sweden has now serious issues. So on that, on that front, I mean, Georgia is at least never went to another extreme. So it goes, moves slowly in, in a certain direction, but I think at some point Georgia will find its own balance. But, uh, but, but church and state, uh, I wouldn't say at this point that it's an ideal balance, but it's moving to that direction. Long answer to short question, yes. <laughs> Of course, first big antiquity trafficking actually happened when, with Russian annexation of Georgia. And most, very significant amount of Georgian cultural, uh, physical heritage. You can, can find them now in different places in, uh, in Moscow and different museums even, but also not only museums uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, of course, before that, again, when we talk about the invasions and, you know, there was no probably peaceful period of Georgian history of like five or ten years in consecutive sort of five or ten years. There was always somebody coming, invading, sometimes Georgians winning, but very rarely. Mostly, most of the time they were losing because they were facing very large uh, force of invaders. So they were taking, so historically Georgia was losing a lot. But uh, in the recent past, there obviously Georgia is transit country. When you say it's transit country, it means transit for everything. So Georgia, there were the attempts to uh, transit through Georgia in the 90s, by the way, of even nuclear materials. And it was, by the way, with a close collaboration with the United States and other European and others, so it was prevented. But this is the challenge. So uh, Georgia is facing some problems in that front, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd say right now, most of the Georgian uh, this, uh, heritage items, uh, art-related uh, treasures, are well protected and well protected uh, by the state, as well as, you know, in general, it's society is very careful about these issues. And, civil society and uh, there are many, many uh, special groups who are kind of watching those elements. But you know, n n it's, it's impossible to prevent it completely. I think we should move to the next. I think it's yeah. time, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
pretty hard act to follow, I guess. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, Polyashvili um, and a little bit about the liturgy and give you a little bit of sort of background sort of information. First, I wanted to thank Mamuka again for... <laughs> he's going to get he's going to get something to eat. Um, for a number of years... Thank you. For a, num for a number of years, uh, Mamuka has been a wonderful representative of Georgia th in lots of different contexts, and, and um, one of them would be here. That would be a logical thing for him. So it's, um, we're really grateful that he's, that he's here. I also wanted to uh, do a shout out to Gabby. Not, I mean, not only has she organized this dinner, but she's organizing the whole trip, which is an incredible undertaking. If you don't know, she's going to go to Georgia in November um, to do some on-the-ground planning um, there. So that'll be, um, I'll be interested to hear what she has to say when she gets back. Um, I also wanted to thank Paul Selker, who's manning the, the uh, tech here. I, sh I, sh I showed up with my computer, and I've got a few pictures that I'm going to put up. Um, and uh, he took and uh, set it up, and he's connected my computer to the thing. And the one thing he said is that you need a new computer. <laughs> so maybe that'll happen. Um, on a slightly more substantive note, I wanted to also um, at this point thank Thea Austin. And the reason I want to do that is because... Um, And the reason I wanted to do that is because Thea is really the person who's responsible, the, who brought um, Georgia to the corral. She brought Polyshuli to the corral. And it's worth just as briefly as I can kind of going through that story so that people understand that this didn't happen because somebody went down to Shermer's and ordered 80 copies of the Polyshuli. <laughs> So there's more, there's more to that story. It started really, and it's just worth going through the story quickly so that people know, in June, in the summer really of uh, 2008, um, Thea, out of the blue, um, I was actually away, so it, I have no responsibility on this, out of the blue uh, made a phone call to Vladimir Morrison, who's the, he's the head of Musica Rusica, which is the publishing company that publishes all of the Russian stuff that we do. It's the one publishing, Russian publishing company in, in America that everybody uses. And, and he's a, not only a publisher, but a real scholar on um, musical matters, particularly Russian musical matters. And Thea had heard uh, Georgian music earlier on in her, back in the 80s, and had fallen in love with it. She knew that the chorale had done uh, some uh, settings, had performed some settings of the St. John Liturgy, and so she calls him up and says, do you know any settings of the St. John Liturgy by a Georgian composer? And he stops for a minute on the phone, and then he says, as a matter of fact, and he said, I've, I'm, I, I'm going to recommend a recording to you, and you should get the recording and listen to it, and then, then we'll talk after that. And so he um, we got a hold of the recording, and so this is what we heard. This is this is the recording that we heard um, that uh, Vladimir Morrison recommended that we get we, and listen to. still gives me shivers. Um, I, I used to listen to that. This is the Jrasa um, Shensa, which is the To the Cross, which is number six in our book. Um, I, I would listen to this like 
18, 20 times, 300 times in a row, over and over again, this particular section. At any rate, um, Fred loved it too, <laughs> and said, we should perform it. So Thea said, okay, and she went back, called Vladimir again and said, well, well we need the score. And he said, well, <laughs> there isn't a score. Um, <laughs> score is out of print, but what I'm gonna do is mail you a copy of my copy of the microfilm copy <laughs> of the 1909 original score that I found in the Lenin Library back in the 80s when I was over there as a researcher. So, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to tell you. Um, so here's the recording. It is, it's not, I'm not sure it's available, it's not available in print on Musica Rusica anymore, but it may be available on eBay or something like that. The interesting thing about this recording is that it's in Russian and it's by a Russian group Church. in Church Salonics. Um, um, so, and I can show you more sort of about this. Um, so, we got this, the score, and the score turns out to be in Georgian and Slavonic, both. Um, Thea checks around as much as she can with as many people as she can um, to find out maybe somebody has done her transliteration and it's available, but it's not, she proves that it's not available. And so, I get the job <laughs> of, turn, of turning this thing into um, a score that the, we can use. Now, which was fine, I mean, that was a wonderful project, but the real kind of bonus about this project was the, the research that kind of went along with it, and it became the most fascinating uh, research project that you could possibly imagine. Um, behind who Polishvili was and what the motivation for writing this piece was and all sorts of context that kind of background that went along with all of that. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. When I heard about the dinner, um, I thought it was sort of worthwhile to kind of give you a little bit more of a briefing on, or a little bit more background kind of on what this piece was and where it came from and kind of what, what was going on. Um, the uh, Polishvili, uh, this is a picture of him, is a figure of national pride in Georgia. Uh, he's known as the father of uh, Georgian classical music. Uh, his dates are um, 1871 to 1933, or his dates. Um, he's he's a regard, revered in, in uh, Georgia, mostly because of two operas that he wrote. and. The, the theme, the, the national anthem, the national anthem for Georgia, which is a new one in 2004, came from themes of two of the, his two most famous operas. And usually the season and the opera season in Georgia begins with a performance of one of those, uh, one of those two operas. Um, uh, he's uh, buried on the grounds of the opera house. And, um, and his portrait, uh, is on the money, and so here's some of the here's Georgian notes. He's on the two dollar, the two dollar, the two. It's called Larry, and I always joke with Larry Thompson. <laughs> and Larry's very pleased that an entire country has named their currency after him. <laughs> so that's him on the two Larry note down there, which is there. And what's interesting is, is that the first notes of the overture to his, the first opera, his first opera, um, is, on the, is on the money, Absalom et 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 um, And I, you sort of wonder, kind of, try to imagine in America, you know, Aaron Copeland being on the, <laughs> you know, like the, the $18 bill or something, I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's, um, I just always been sort of, sort of struck by that. So, um, Polish, Polish was born in 1871, as I said, in Kutaisi, which is a city, it's sort of the second most important city, I think, in Georgia. Uh, it's in the West. He was the third of 18 children, um, many of whom didn't survive uh, at, back in that time. The important thing about, one important thing to note about him was that he was Georgian Catholic. He wasn't Orthodox. And this is important because uh, in Georgian Catholic or Catholic Church, he would have been exposed to instrumental music as part of the service, and it would have been Western music. 
So that's what he was brought up with. As opposed to in the Orthodox Church, instruments aren't used as a cappella, and it would have been all Russian-centric. He was exposed to, you know, the Western music as we would have known it, as we know it. Um, both he and his older brother, he had an older brother named Ivano, who was also a very talented musician. And the two of them, the, the Catholic Church in Tbilisi got heard of the, these guys, this family, and they hired, um, they urged or lured Zakaria and his brother Ivano to come to be part of the music program in Tbilisi, and the whole family decided they'd all go. So they all went to Tbilisi where Vano became the church organist and Zakaria became the assistant organist. In 1891, uh, Palishvili entered the T Tbilisi Music School and he graduated from there in 1899. Uh, and then he spent an important three years at the Moscow Conservatory, which is a really sort of important, crucial sort of part of his education. After 1903, he came back um, and Moscow Conservatory at the time just was an extremely important center for a number of things. Um, one of which is a lot of the music that we have sung uh, came from Moscow composers who were at that period. Um, it's called the New Russian Choral School. Um, the Synod, which is the Synod School, which is the school that was teaching church musicians, was right next door to the conservatory. There was a lot of cross-fertilization about things sort of at the time. So Kostalsky was, uh, a product of that. Kostalski was at the Synod School, but Gretchen Enoff grew, uh, was a recent graduate from, um, or not actually, he was attended, um, but Rachmaninoff was a recent graduate of the Moscow Conservatory. So he came, Palish Filiam, he came back, um, established a career in, uh, in 1903 as an organizer of lots of different kinds of um, uh, musical activities uh, in Tbilisi. Um, and then he, uh, he really became known as a composer, as I say, in 1919 um, with his first opera, Absalom and Terry, and then his second opera, which is Daisy, which is in 19, he premiered in 1923, and he died in 1933. So the liturgy was written in 1909, so it's relatively early in his composing co career, and it's the largest um, work that he had composed up to that point. He had some songs that were famous but it was the largest work that uh, up to that point. And the liturgy is a setting, if for those who aren't, haven't done it maybe, is a setting of uh, Georgian liturgical chants, which Mamuka mentioned about lit Georgian chant. This is a setting of ancient Georgian liturgical chants, which is used in the most common everyday non-feast Eucharist Orthodox service. So it's the sort of day-to-day -day service. It's not the services that they would do at Easter, but it would be the time, the ones that they would, rest of the time. So one of the big res, res, sort of research questions that came to my mind early is why would um, a Georgian Catholic write a setting of the Orthodox service as being one of the major pieces early in his career? Why would he, why would he do that? And I'm gonna give you two answers, um, which is sort of this, what I wanted to do tonight is just to that. There's so much more stuff that, to talk about, but I just, I'll leave it to that. Just the, the two answers on why he did this particular piece. Um, the first one is that uh, for Palishvili, the liturgy was not an expression of religious belief, but was his expression of pride in Georgian cultural heritage. And as Mamuka mentioned, uh, they regard polyphonic singing, Georgian polyphonic singing, as an important element of their cultural heritage, whether you're Orthodox or not. It's, it's, it's part of their, not, it, it occurs, polyphonic singing occurs not only in their church services, but also in their um, folk songs as well. Um, by 1909, which is when he wrote it, Georgia had been part of the Russian Empire, as he was, as Mumka was describing, for more than 100 years. Um, the cultural policies uh, that the Russian Empire imposed on Georgia over that time had worn away many Georgia's cultural traditions and institutions. Uh, use of the Georgian language in schools um, had been forbidden, so kids had to read in Russian Georgian novels or whatever it is that you read. Um, and the Georgian Orthodox Church had nominally been 
abolished, which meant that it had been, a, it had been um, abolished as a separate um, independent entity equal to the Russian Orthodox Church. It was not, no longer an independent entity and the Russian Orthodox Church took over. It's a little unclear from the record exactly how strict that was um, adhered to, but in a nominal basis, that was the case. Um, so, and it's also, it's important to, to really understand that polyphonic singing, liturgical singing, is really an important, unique, essential element, along with the language, um, if, uh, element of Georgia's cultural heritage. Um, scholars believe that it, uh, it appeared in about the 9th or 10th century. It's hard to obviously date exactly. But that's probably three or 400 years before poly polyphony appeared in the West. And Georgians are very proud of that. Um, for almost a thousand years, um, this form of music um, had been passed down from generation to generation orally. It was an oral tradition. Um, and it was transmitted by what are known as master chanters. There were people who were devoted to this, and they were in different schools located around the country. Um, Moke has showed pictures of um, Galati. That was one of the centers of Georgian um, traditional chant. That was the center of a, of a school, of um, one of the regional chant schools. Um, by the, so the fact that what had happened is that basically by the end of the 19th century when, when Palishvili was, was growing up and then becoming a composer, uh, Georgian litur liturgical chant had suffered severely under, under Russian rule and that the master chanters and the practice of Georgian liturgical chant was disappearing. So what happened was that a number of people, particularly in the church, began projects to transcribe, to go out and transcribe down, write down Georgian chant. They would sit chanters, master chanters down, and they would write down on paper what these guys sang. Um, and Palishvili, what's interesting, and no one's, unless you've seen the original sort of score, is, is that with the, the original score in 1909, Palishvili actually wrote a foreword in the document, in the score, that appears ahead of the score, in which he talks about what kind of his purpose is and what he's trying to do. And he says that um, uh, it's what he kind of makes, he describes the dismal condition of Russian chant, I mean, uh, Georgian chant at that time, how it had deteriorated. And he makes clear that, that this document, this liturgy that he's writing is going to be his contribution to the preservation of Georgian chant. Um, uh, so, we, and we can see this, his intent um, behind this in a couple of ways. One of them is uh, this. This is the cover page of the, the 1909 edition, the original edition. And um, I took this photo. This, this is from um, the... This is a copy that is at Palishvili's birth house in Kutaisi. And it's got an inscription on the top where he's made a gift of this edition to his uncle. And it's dated, uh, in, it's Christmas. It's a Christmas gift in uh, 1910. And the thing to point out about this is the words, and you've got a pointer. I don't know where the pointer is on this thing. Is there a pointer? On this one? No. There. So here, um, that's Georgian. <laughs> and here are the words for Georgian. So if there's any doubt about what the emphasis is here, and just to be clear <laughs> about what my intent is, <laughs> is I just want you to know that this is Georgian. And he says it here, and he says it here in, in, uh, in Russian as well. So you can sort of tell f kind of what, the in, what, he's, what he's kind of wanting to, to say here. The other kind of thing I wanted to mention, there are a lot of other things, but the other one I wanted to mention is, is that in the t music itself, 
all of the elements of, uh, Saint, of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom are there. Um, all the essential elements are there. Um, but then he's added a bunch of stuff as well that's not part of the St. John liturgy. And the one thing that he's thrown in there in addition is Shen Harbanaki, which is not part of the liturgy. And you kind of go, what's that about? And uh, Shen Harbanaki is a, is a very important um, f kind of folk, it's hard to just kind of capture all of it because there's nothing parallel, but kind of a folk hymn that has very strong national connotations and um, to, to people. And the interesting thing about it is, is it's the only piece in the uh, liturgy that is not, has no Russian, there's no Cyrillic, there's no Cyrillic translation for it. And so it's the one piece that's not included. <laughs> in, in this. So, you know, you sort of, you kind of go, Oh, um, so that, um, I, it's a, sort of probably a good point to mention sort of right now that um, John Graham, who is our tour guide, but you all should know, is also the world expert in the English language on Georgian, um, the pre preservation movement of Georgian chant. Um, he's written his dissertation on it um, and he, he knows he is the man and has done for many years um, in Georgia, has done um, work in the archives, retrieve, uh, there's a long story about it, I try, try not to get into it, but, but archives with the original documents, those transcriptions that people wrote down, those all got, when the Soviets came in, those all got um, hidden um, and saved. Um, it's a long story, it's a fascinating story, but at any rate, those became known back in the 90s and people, be, archivists went crazy. I mean, here's this entire trove of material, unknown previously, that, and John was, is one of the people who is um, in the archives researching it and, and understanding it. So he's your tour guide. And I've been trying to think of an analogy. It's sort of like, um, you know, going to Salzburg and having Mozart uh, be your tour guide, or you know, it's it, there's something like that. I mean, it, this is this is a very special uh, opportunity and relationship to have to be able to to work with John and to have have that going on. Um, uh, one thing you there is a on on the website Corral website on at the beginning. There, if you find it right, there's an article. Um, that John and I wrote together that, that summarizes a lot about the liturgy. It's, if you dig around, you, it's on the Corral website, you can find, find that. The other thing that you could, should make a note of that if, is of interest is that on John, one of John's websites called John Graham Tours, all one word, John Graham Tours, um, he has probably the most comprehensive collection of material on Shen Harbanaki ever collected in one place, including 100 different recordings on YouTube of, of Shen Harbanaki. Um, I, I don't know that. <laughs> these, are, these, are, but vi these are videos. These are videos of people doing it. Did you? Okay, okay, cool. Um, but it's it's worth it's worth going in because it gives you some sense of the scholarship that John does, and that's behind all of this. And that's sort of um, there is a wonderful one of the one of the ones is from uh, Slavia, which is a singing group here in Washington. That and Thea and Ann Harrison are um, are recorded on that, so they're they're on that website. So Polishili's strong patriotic feelings for Georgia and his hometown of Kutaisi are well known. Um, as a boy, uh, Padishili sang in a youth choir, in an ethnographic choir, f uh, folk songs in uh, Belize. Um, when, uh, in 2012, uh, Fred and I and Tim Temple and Phoebe Temple joined 10, 12 other people on a tour for the John Graham, and we went around and saw a lot of the things that Mamuka pointed out to today, saw a lot of those. And one of them is, this is um, at, uh, this is Palishvili's birth house. 
in Kutaisi. It's on a river, there's a river behind it that you can see. But the reason I wanted to point this out is behind it, and you can see the crane and so forth, is, um, uh, is Bagati, Bagrati Cathedral, which is one of the sort of national landmarks of Georgia. Um, it was built in the 11th century, got blown up by the Turks in the 17th century, and they've just finished rebuilding it. <laughs> Um, it took a long time, and there's a lot of controversy about how they rebuilt it. And so, but the but the point is that um, every day when Polishvili woke up, that was his house. He saw Bagrati right behind him, and so it gives you to stand there. Sort of, that's Fred. Um, <laughs> um, I'm taking a picture of Fred taking a picture of so forth. And there's Bagrati Cathedral. So uh, I think um, Pajshvili felt the history of his home region very keenly. Um, this was the region, uh, Moka talked about Jason and the Argonauts. This was the region where that was located. So there's a lot of history here. Kutaisi dates, you know, there's records of it dating back to the 5th and 6th century BC. It was capital of the United Georgia back in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, however, um, it suffered a lot of subjugation as, as was discussed. Um, the Turks invaded it a lot, blew up the cathedral, as I say, and until 1810 when it was taken over by the Russians. So, um, so my first answer to the question of sort of motivation of, of the liturgical one is, is sort of a patriotic one. It's a, of one of preserving cultural heritage of Georgia, even though he wasn't um, orthodox. It was, a, it was part of preserving Georgian's cultural heritage. My second an answer, so that's the first one is Polyshvili as a Georgian. My second answer to this, why did he do this, is Polyshvili as a musician. And it leads to a sort of ironic kind of tract, given the first answer which is that he wrote the liturgy because that's what Russian composers, this is my belief, that's what Russian composers that he met in Moscow in 1900 to 1903, that's what they were composing. And so there's, there's part of this piece that's not Georgian, um, but is Western or even Russian. Um, and there's several things, tracks to lead up to that. One is, as I said before, as a Georgian Catholic, he was aware of, oriented really, and admired Western music. Um, and growing up as, and then after moving to Tbilisi and being in the uh, Tbilisi Music School, it was clear that Russia was the big time if, if you were a musician. Um, Georgia was on the outs, was one of the outskirts of the empire. Um, the school that he attended was administered by the uh, Russian Music Society, and all the teachers were Russian. Um, when he got to Moscow Conservatory, I mean, he was in the middle of really an incredible outpouring, as I've said, of Russian liturgical music, many, much of which we've sung. Um, but it was a really an incredible period with Gretchen, people being active, Gretcheninov, Ippolita Fafanov, Smolensky, Rachmaninov, Kostalsky, it was, it's an amazing period. Um, uh, and many of them are composing liturgies to, of, to the St. John Chrysostom. So m m my belief as well is that this piece is Palyashvili's contribution to this outpouring of liturgical music. Um, uh, there's a particular fascinating connection with um, Ippolita Vavanov, who was the head of the music school when he was there. He, he got there, Polyshvili got there in 1891. Poly, Ippolita Favanov had been there for 10 years, was there until 1893, and he then went to Moscow and became a professor. Um, Ippolita Favanov, um, when Tchaikovsky came to visit Tbilisi three or four or five times because his brother was a senior Russian administrator in Tbilisi, and so Tchaikovsky would come, and Ippolita Favanov would be the guy to go hang out with Tchaikovsky. And then everybody went, oh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. He's only, he's only 12 years older than, he's half, sort of half a generation older than Polyashvili is. And when Ippolita Favanov leaves 
Georgia in 1893, within a year, he writes Caucasian Sketches, which is probably Vilena Vafanov's most famous work. F my point of view would be that Pajshvili would take that as, um, as a justification or as a, um, that you could take Georgian subjects and do serious music with them. It's, it's okay, it's okay to be Georgian, it's okay to have to write George material, serious material on Georgian themes. Um, so when he, Pajshvili follows him to Moscow and, um, and uh, Ippolyta Vavanov writes his own setting of the St. John Liturgy in 1903 when, when um, Pajshvili is just ready to go. And the, the key thing though is, is that out of the thousands of transcriptions that were done um, back then, um, the, one, the, the one that Pajshvili chose to use and is the basis for the work that we sing is the Ippolyta Vavanov transcription. Um, which was on Eastern chant, chant from the Eastern part of Georgia. And he did it transcribing master chanters who were people that Pajshvili knew um, from, the Eastern, from Eastern Georgia. So out of all of the different things that he could have chosen, that was the one, that's, those are the ones that, that he had done. He believed Vavanov had been hired by one of the preservation committees to sit down with these guys, we did, and, and wrote out this stuff. And that became, and I actually have a copy of the 1899, it was published in 1899, somebody sent me a copy of it. So, so um, he partially notes in his foreword also that one of the purposes for him including it, writing it in Russian and in, um, or Slavonic and in Georgian, is to quote, spread awareness of Georgian chant among Russian audiences. So clearly he's kind of, you know, he wants to play in that game. I mean, that's, that's what he wants to do. Um, so, and one of the things that, are, it's important to, there are a lot of different things to mention, but one is that there are a lot of Russian non-Georgian elements um, in the liturgy. Georgia chant is always three parts, uh, usually fairly close together um, in terms of voicing. Um, the liturgy has, his liturgy has five, six, seven parts written out, um, as he would have heard kind of choralizations that he would have heard in Moscow. Um, it's for mixed voices so that the voicing is much wider apart than it would be in true and traditional chant. And he used European tuning. He used tuning that we would be used to in the West, um, uh, as opposed to Georgian tuning, which is entirely different. <laughs> and um, you can hear a little bit of Georgian tuning. Well, um, th that's, um, there are a lot of different regions in Georgia. That's from a particular um, region, but it gives you some sense of what the tuning, that the tuning is very different, and it's not the tuning that Georgian, that uh, Polyashvili used. He explicitly did not you do that. And so um, the traditional Georgia, the Georgian traditionalists um, at the time said, you've changed the soul of our chant. And there was very strong objection to, to it. And um, it became, it's one of the reasons why I think that the, that the liturgy is not known in Georgia um, at all because it's not, in this aspect of it, it's not Georgian. Um, so it's, that's sort of something to sort of keep in mind. Um, it's so unknown, I had the experience, one of the people that was helping me kind of doing this stuff was a PhD grad student in music. She was writing her dissertation on Georgian liturgical chant uh, she spoke German, Georgian, her husband was Georgian, she'd written um, an undergraduate thesis on one of Polyashvili's operas, and I sent her this thing, and she said, I, 
I had no idea. I'd never heard of this piece. <laughs> so it gives you some sense that, um, that we're in kind of new territory kind of here. Anyway, the last, I'll leave, end with just with the kind of the summary that I've, that's been written elsewhere, which is that it, it um, uh, the liturgy's not really well known because it's too Russian for the Georgians, it's too Georgian for the Russians, and it's too religious for the communists. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's all I have to say. Yes, and, and I know this, <laughs> and, and the, the answer is really, uh, there may, be a, it may have been more than once, but the one I know, and this is really weird, in Surrey, Maine, <laughs> there, there used to be, the guy died, the guy who headed this was named Walter Novick, and he, um, just extraordinary and eccentric person, had the Surrey Opera Company. And it basically consisted of fishermen and lobstermen <laughs> and stuff like that. But... Surrey in England? No, Surrey, Maine. 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 Between Ellsworth and Blue Hill. <laughs> and he, and he, did, he actually took some of, he took some of these operas overseas with I mean it's the whole thing is I won't get into the whole thing story but I know that he did do Absalom and Terry um, and it's just when I found that out my like my mind went <laughs> but anyway he's not alive anymore which is too bad because it's really that whole somebody needs to do a whole thing about the Surrey Opera Company but anyway and it may have been done elsewhere but I, I don't know my one I have one thing on my bucket list before I die, which is to hear either one of these or both at the Padishvili Opera House. Um, and so, I don't think it is, no, no. Talk about some sort of Maybe we'll make them. So, so one of the, thi one of the, just sort of quickly, one of the interesting things about it is, so this, this work disappeared, um, sort of as, as a performance work under the Soviets, nobody really the obvious. In the 60s in Georgia, um, there began interest on the part of a couple of people, ethnomusicologists, to begin to revive chant. And all of the chants that, that had been transcribed were, being, were hidden. Those weren't available. The one thing that they had were some of the works that Palishvili had done. But he'd written them out in, you know, he'd taken three-part chant, and he'd written it out in five and six and seven parts. So they took the five, six, seven parts and rewrote them as three parts. Well, they tried to figure it out. What you said. Well, they, yeah, they tried to fig figure it out. But anyway, they re re reversed it. And so some of these became, um, record were recorded. There were some of the record recordings um, that reached the West that had some of these things in. Rastavi. The recording that I played of the Georgian piece is came from a recording of from R the Rastavi ensemble, which is the, it was sort of the most famous ensemble back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, that recorded this stuff and was just sort of available. And it really, particularly after um, the communists fell, the res there has been enormous research in, in interest in uh, Georgian tr um, chant. And it's, but it's all, it's very traditional. So, um, and the interest is really on um, the kind of tuning, going back to original um, Georgian tuning. So that's, um, so. Much of, much of it. Well. Because things like Shin Harbanaki, the three part that Anzo Ekomarashvili came up with is still very popular. See, I think it's a hunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. 
So, um... Should, should I sit down? I... No, 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 no. So, Anzor Erko Mahashvili is the um, leader, or was the leader, I think he still is, of the Rustavi Ensemble. He's an ethnomusicologist, and when he was a student, he and other um, students were interested in, in finding these chants and trying to figure out what they might have sounded like originally, what, what Pagashvili sources sounded like originally, and they did try to figure out what was the, the essential source, what the three lines would have been in this polyphonic chant. And they came up with their version of it, and it happens that uh, on this lovely CD, Georgian Voices, um, there are two pieces that have become very, very well known to Americans who have been converted to Georgian singing. <laughs> And it's not uncommon that when you talk to Americans who've become, who've really fallen in love with Georgian singing, that they fell in love with um, one of two chants. It's Mindel Khmerto and Shen Harvanahi. And both of those versions are versions of Polyashvili's settings that Erko Mayashvili um, recorded or put together. So, um, they were very important, and Polyashvili was, in fact, very important in preserving some, some awareness of traditional chant, even though, you know, it, he did change some things. And, and certainly with, with the Soviet Union, um, you know, in charge for 70 years, um, the, the aesthetics of, of, West, of Russian music and sort of the Russian version of Western music did uh, dominate in conservatories, and that was tempered Western tuning. So a, a Georgian fifth is evenly divided. The, di the distance between the notes is even. So um, anyway, th so it's, it's different. But if you're interested, this is a fantastic album and Georgian Voices. And listen to Tzmindel Khmerto and uh, Shenhar and all the other things on here. So, so you can imagine what our car rides are like. <laughs> I, I, Corral should realize uh, we're very, very lucky to have um, three people in the Corral who are extremely knowledgeable, have years of experience in Georgian singing, have been to Georgia, have studied with Georgian masters. Um, um, Silvio Everhart. Right here, and Anne Harrison is back in the back there, and then Thea as well. So um, it's um, it's really a gift to have those, that that kind of expertise sort of kind of around. Any other questions? Yeah, Kate. Georgian. Okay, and then fun coincidental fact is that today is actually St. John Chrysostom's birthday. Ah. Yesterday was his feast day because of Matthew on Catherine's birthday. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just think it's really funny that we're having this Georgian feast about our, partially about our piece about the liturgy, how you believe the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom today on his birthday yesterday. His, um, in Russian, the, his, it's translated as golden mouth. Um, and so he's known as an order. As an order. Um, so, uh, Polyashvili's birthday is in August, so we never get to uh, celebrate. So we never get to sing happy birthday. Yeah. So, any other questions? <laughs> Yeah. 
So um, the, the first conversation was in the summer of 2008. Um, we actually went back and looked at emails trying to sort of figure out all of this. Um, the actual editing business probably didn't start until kind of March or June, summerish of 2009. Um, and then we performed it in June 2010. So, and it was probably done by the end, by December-ish. So it was probably a six month thing. But the research business sort of kind of went on for a long time. Um, and, and it was a lot of, it, um, ran into a lot of sort of wonderful people who you know, had interesting things to say about it. Um, there was a, there's a professor at, in Tbilisi at the conservatory who's, um, who was very helpful and dug stuff up and sent us, she sent the score that we have, the title page that I showed you, um, when the Lenin Library makes copies of things and you get a, a microfilm back then at any rate, they didn't give you the title page. So the copy that I got didn't have the title page on it. Um, so wasn't wasn't sure, I, and I didn't see it until I, the woman at the conservatory in Tbilisi sent me a, a, a um, file with all of it, including the cover page. And that was the first time that I'd sort of actually seen it. And I kind of went, "Oh my God, there's this how that that works." So that was that that was very helpful. So it was probably a six month kind of actually editing that that took place. But the research kind of went on and on. I, Sort of after that. So, so I actually had a little bit of a, an agenda about wanting to talk about this tonight because just to kind of put a notice that, you know, it's, it's not like we're arriving with a piece, you know, that everybody knows and is gonna be universally accepted. Um, an interesting sort of fact is, for some reason, and I don't know how this happened, at the same time in 2010 when we were doing all of this, I discovered another group in the Netherlands who was also doing the same thing. And the guy had gone to Georgia, had somewhere had discovered this thing. I never discovered why. He came back. And you can see on YouTube uh, performances by this Netherlands group in 2010 of, um, of this thing. Well, I was fascinated about trying to find out what, how this was. And um, so I, I don't know, I, I can't remember how I did this, but I ended up emailing with some woman who was in the chorus who was doing this and asking her kind of what was happening and so she described kind of what was going on and she was vague about the director and why he was, where he'd gotten it and so forth. And I was never able to reach him directly but they, after they performed it in the Netherlands, they actually went to Georgia and performed it in Tbilisi. And I never got, so it's, when we go we won't be the first time, it won't be the first time in Tbilisi since, to, since, since uh, 1909. But her, I, I asked her about sort of how to go and what happened and so forth, and she's, she didn't give me the full story, but she intimated that there were problems. And a lot of the problems had to do with the, as I think Mamuko was saying, that the, the church is fairly conservative, it's, it's quite conservative. And they were taking a dim view, and some of the singers, they'd recruited some singers in, and some of those singers had taken a dim view about the liturgical aspects about it and how that was being treated. And so I think it's worth talking to with John and being kind of aware of the setting and actual how the presentation is gonna be kind of made. I think most people think that Palashvili wrote this as a concert piece because you would never in a church, in a Russian, in a Georgian church, do this. I mean, you would never have that size group. He explicitly says in the foreword, I've done it for mixed choir, for big numbers. You would never do that. And so we think it's sort of a concert piece. And so one of the, re I, I, I asked John last week, I wrote him and said, so in 1909, would there be SATB choirs um, who could have performed this? I mean, who 
who was, if everybody's singing three-part things, you know, in groups of 10, who, who did it? I mean, where, you know, he wrote back, he said that Palishvili had been, was obviously, as we know, closely associated with the opera, and that there were opera choruses who were prepped to perform works and so forth. So that was probably the vehicle for, for doing it. But apart from that, there wasn't probably much. So I'll be interested to see, but it's not at all a given that, you know, what we're gonna be doing is necessarily gonna comport with, with whatever. Hold it. Yes. 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 Yeah. John is converted. John converted to Orthodox, um, and knows everybody in Georgia, um, <laughs> and so and so really has a has as good a sense I think of anybody on what's appropriate and and how to make this happen. And I think uh, s some of the problems that this. Dutch group had, they were small, they, they uh, um, maybe 15, 20 people, they, they recruited a few Georgian singers, but they, they added a deacon part, which is not really part of Palyashvili's composition, and they did some of, they tried to do some of it in churches, and so I think those were the things. That they sang it in Georgian, so I think that it was, it was trying to put it into a religious context, uh, was where they got, and I think, and our approach is to treat it as a concert piece. So that's that will be very different. But having John, you know, guide us is is uh, is very important. But the thing is, and one thing that's really important in the forward that Polyashvili Polyashvili writes is that it's in his view, it's important that music that's sung, religious music, be so beautiful that it converts the non-believer. So that's what he tried to do. Any, anything else? Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, so don't go far, guys. Uh, Trust me, they'll stop. One. Before you do that, Trust before you do that. I just want to say. First of all, I talked to John today. He's, he's super excited about having us. He was sitting in a cafe and listening to like John Lennon's Imagine on, there's like a Muzak recording of Imagine behind him, which is just funny, because he's like Mr. Georgian Liturgy. Um, he's really pumped to have us all. I'm really excited to go out and meet him in November. Um, Jess is going to oh, lead us. Is, is this Vox Polka happening yeah, right now? Yeah. This is Vox Polka, everybody. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of Vox Polka. So this is a Georgian traditional chant. It's from Samarello. Have I said that right? Oh, it's that one. Oh, right, it's moving. Um, so this is just this is just a Georgian song we're pulling out. It's an alilo, which means hallelujah. We've had wine, so we're going to sing. <laughs> hallelujah. And you know the song, sing along. Yeah. Um, and yes, so anyway, hallelujah.
this. <laughs> um, Ali Lowe's are uh, sung at Christmas. They mean, with the one thought is that they mean hallelujah. They also could be related to some pre-Christian sort of ritual. Anyway, uh, this fall, Silvio and Ann and I are going to teach some traditional Georgian songs that we can all sing uh, here and there because there are all kinds of moments where you just feel like singing. And so we're going to do that and we'll figure out some kind of a schedule and announce it and we can all get together and do that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So I will just say, everybody, um, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, if there is wine left, please feel free to stay and drink it. Um, I think we're going to start to probably clean up some stuff around us and get this room back to the way it's supposed to be. Um, but again, thank you guys so much. Thank you to Parker and to Mamuka for telling us their story tonight. Drink the wine! <laughs>